number of times that the stack is wrong is relatively small in comparison to the number of devices scanned. Um, you know, it's, an it's a very small incremental improvement. Um, that said, it's an interesting problem set, and, and the problem set of relying on a set of data that can be so easily mangled it is by itself a reason to explore it. It's, it's why you'd explore that problem, but people are going to be bored to tears by talking about it because the problem set is so small that, that most people just don't even notice it. You know, most people don't, wouldn't even know that that happens. Mm. That's the one problem. Yeah. What happens when you're at security competitions and you're lying like crazy to the guy's game? <laughs> yeah. There's very few situations I could see it where well, it's been that useful. It's like plot. we had a really cool what tool. NAT configurations? Uh, NAT doesn't always affect it. It yeah. doesn't affect it often enough to matter. Really? Yeah, yeah. really. Go into a large corporate environment and, and map 50,000 hosts, and the number of times you will find a mistake from normal stack is like that. So tiny as to be inconsequential within the overall result set. You know, not statistically significant, so to speak. Yeah. That what happens when they're in your network? What, what happens once they're in your network? That doesn't do anything at that point. Yeah, but you know, you do have to get a full foothold on the network at some point. There's always a hole. Yeah, but, you know. If that hole requires you to know the operating system, or at least have a good idea of what the operating system is. I don't know what you're saying. I haven't used this email in this conversation, but no, I do derail. What do you do when what you're passionate about and interested in doesn't really have much real world applicability or it will. isn't interesting to many other people? It will be. I, I think that you have to balance two things, right? I mean, um, I think, I think that, you know, we all live in a real world, so we all have real bills and, you know, we all have real responsibility. So, you know, um, I think that, like, so you see, like, like I, here's a good, like, here's, um, it's probably the best way I can re equate something like this. And it's, um, um, my, my wife, um, she's a playwright. And, um, you know, she's not a um, Broadway playwright. Um, she's very well educated. She's done some good, some festivals and some things like that, but she couldn't make a living on playwriting and stuff like that. So when I met her, she was working at a, um, she, she, she spent 40, 50 hours a week playwriting, you know, but she had a 40, 50 hour a week job um, working at a, a musical theater licensing company and stuff like that. So she can be kind of immersed in that industry. And so she followed her passion at night and, you know, hopefully one day, her work will be relevant and maybe one day there'll be a big premiere and stuff like that. But I use that as, you know, not knowing your personal interests and things like that, but, um, you know, like one day maybe her work will be relevant. And I think that, you know, I give her a lot of credit for always, for, for, for not losing her passion towards her work because she believes in herself and that one day it's going to be there. So the best thing I can tell you is that, you know, you have to figure out a way to A, pay the bills, and then B, your work will become relevant. It, it will become something where, um, you know, there might not be a big broad market. I don't know what it is, but it might not be a big broad market. And that's fine. I mean, but, but, but if, if, you, if you stay to something that you feel really good about and you pour your whole effort into it, I mean, chances are that someday down the road, it's going to, regardless of what it means to everybody else, you'll have that own personal satisfaction that, you know, it, it meant something to you and you did it, and you did it really well. Does, does that make sense or am I off? Yeah, so it, I understand what you're saying, 140 characters or less. Um, do what you love and everything <laughs> else will fall into place. Well, well, and actually, I, I think Lee's a little more pragmatic than that, but I, that's what I would say in 140 characters or less. You would say, do what you love and make sure you pay the bills at the same time. Uh, I'm, I'm um, a big, I'm, you know, I'm very much a realist. Yes, I, it, I mean. he is, but I think in this industry, and, and I, I think the playwriting, the playwright example isn't as relevant in this industry. Um, his paper is boring to 95% of the people at this conference. Um, I wish he was still here so I could talk to him about it. But He'll be back. I mean, his, his paper... He's going to cry right now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> his paper is not something that, that everyone in this industry is going to be interested in. 
But if you put him in a room of the seven vulnerability engineers at N-Circle, it's a five-day long fascinating conversation. Um, part of doing what you love is finding an audience of people who also do what you love. Um, him talking to the guys at you know, a big insurance company or, or a financial services company, they're going to glaze over in 30 seconds, and they're not going to offer him a job for it. Um, and circle mind. And he would probably kill himself if he yes, worked probably, there. And, <laughs> and vice versa, right? So, so the thing is, I, I, especially in this industry, there are very, f I have, I can think of one really interesting, dude, I've been talking about you the whole time you were out of the room. I can think of one um, very, yeah, no, I haven't, I'm not. Um, I can think of one paper I've ever seen that couldn't have led someone to a job, and that was uh, a Frederick Diggle advisory on uh, Vondev about vulnerabilities in Notepad. Um, <laughs> you you want to look that up? No, we know. Yes, you know what I'm talking. You know what I'm talking about. Um, so uh, the thing is, you can have the most obscure interest in this industry. You know, whether it's operating system detection or vulnerabilities in VMS or whatever. I and mean, the nice thing about this industry is most of the stuff becomes relevant eventually. I mean, the people that like five or six years ago were exploring vulnerabilities in JavaScript and um, cross-site scripting stuff, you know, suddenly became relevant in 2005 and now it's the big part of the industry. The things that have yet to be explored in this industry are usually the most profitable ones. If you're doing what everybody else is doing, you're probably not. You're late. Yeah, you're late. So, this is this is a what time did the party start? Yeah, this is this is a particularly <laughs> interesting industry in that it's not there's very few playwrights in this industry. There's very few um, there's very few things that you're going to be completely uh, by the time you get it good enough to be almost done, you're going to be relevant. Is really what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, I started talking about the social engineering stuff. When did we meet? That was my first talk on social engineering. Yeah, 2004. Yeah, so it's 2004, Hope? Close to four. Or 2006. Hope 2K6. That was what it was. Um, I started talking about it then. Only now is there a market for it. But I've had three years of prep. I've got hundreds of PowerPoint slides. I've got hundreds of distinctions that no one else does because it's what I've been working on for three years. Um, didn't make me a damn bit of money then. Um, we've already got multiple signups for our first training class at ChicagoCon because people are starting to see that social engineering is now the big deal and people are starting Why to, is that? Because we're solving most of the other problems. It's harder now to attack the computers. Back in the day, yeah. it was easy to get a remote root on some box when NetBIOS is open to the world. It's way, e it's way yeah. easier for me to talk someone out of their password than to steal it from their computer. Simpler. So. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's just... Isn't that a little touch of irony? <laughs> well, it's, it's cyclical. I'm, and in the webinar we did on Tuesday, we talked about the cycle. We've spent the last 10 years focusing all of our energy and all of our effort on securing the computers. We ignored the people. So the people are the, are the target. We're going to spend the next five years focusing on teaching our people not to do stupid things, and by then the computers will all be vulnerable again. I, I would also argue that landscape of attack vectors. Social engineering is one that's used to uh, perpetrate a targeted attack versus the technical method is one that's able to implement a widespread mass market. Uh, agreed and disagree because, uh, because you're starting to see mass social engineering attacks on Facebook and, and through large email. You know, you I, so, I, I, I suppose, uh, I, suppose I, I think of social engineering more along the lines of the yeah, when you start incorporating technology in it. It's a technical measure. It's a technical measure. Right? If it's social engineering or not. Yeah. I really feel like antivirus, when antivirus 2009 is the trendy kid of malware. Like, whatever is popular, it's got it. You know, like, what, what, can, can anyone think of like a malware tactic that's been used in recent years that when antivirus, do that, that when antivirus has not at some point incorporated? Like, I actually just got antivirus 2009 on one of my computers because I have to be using an old version of Firefox. And I was hmm. pitched to root out too. It was terrible. Yeah. 
We're not doing the social engineering talk, so. Oh. Uh, you want to switch slides? I'll do, you do want that to, one. You want, to, you, you, no, you, you want to go through the presentation? Right, let's, let's do this one. Okay, good. Um, I, I, I think by now we already, everybody already knows who we are, right? We probably don't need this slide up here. Um, in case people don't know, wow, can you all see that at all? It says the downturn. It says the downturn. It says we're, we're in a crappy economy, um, in case anyone hasn't seen the news in the last few years. Um, I've seen estimates that unemployment will reach 15% by the end of the year. That's big. You know, that's significant. We, we haven't had 15% unemployment since the Depression. Let's, let's even say that unemployment got up to, you know, a lot of you know, more, more conservative estimates are somewhere between 9 and 10% and employment. And that doesn't even factor into people who have, quote unquote, you know, given up on the job market and stuff like that. I mean, you know, people just, you know, call, you know, checking out, you know? I mean, I mean, do you, I mean, do you guys realize the magnitude of that? I mean, you know, like, I mean, do, do you realize just like the, the magnitude, I mean, uh, of the scope of having one out of every 10 people who are able and willing to work not have a job? I mean, the thought of, you know, I mean, you see, I see it a little bit in my peer group because I'm not all security. I see it in my office every day, but I mean, my peer group. I, I live in a town that's about an hour from Manhattan. Um, a lot of the people who you know live in that town and live in my neighbors are um, they're not Wall Street executives. They're not you know those hundred million dollar bonus people. They're you know IT or operations or accounting. You know, they're people who in you know New Jersey on a good year. On a bad year, they might make $120,000, $130,000 a year. On a bad year, they, on a great year, they might make one fifty to one seventy-five, which you know, their two children, the SUV in the driveway. You know, I'm, 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 cons I'm I've moved out to suburbia, right? So, but you have all this, you have all these people, and, and you think about one out of every ten of those people not being able to pay their mortgage, because a lot of happens is that I see it is that people are getting very nervous because it's not a scenario. Those are the people at the highest risk too because like a lot of these folks, they've lost a lot of their quote unquote um, ability to function as individual contributors. They've lost their, their marketability has gone past where they are. So in other words, their, their compensation has kind of surpassed their skill set. And um, the fact is that those are the people that are getting eliminated. Um, yeah, it's, it's scary. I, you just reminded me of it when you were talking about your peer group. I, I notice it. I work for myself, obviously, and work remotely from everybody that, that is around me. And because of my incredible inability to focus for longer than five minutes, I have to work outside my house. I can't sit at home or I'll do the dishes or something. Um, so I always work at Starbucks. You will always, if you want to find me, I'm in a Starbucks somewhere. And usually when I'm at home, I'm in the same Starbucks, which is right next to my house. And convenient. <laughs> it, it, it's very convenient. It's actually in my apartment complex. It's really kind of cool. Um, every time I go home from one of these trips, there are more people in the Starbucks. I doubt this time when I, when I get home, and I haven't really been working there for a couple of weeks now, um, I, will I doubt that I will get a, get a table this time. Like you're, it's now to the point that you have to fight for tables because people who are normally going to work every day are now job searching out of Starbucks. Good for Starbucks not so good for the economy as a whole. Um, but so, I mean, it's funny because, you know, you're talking about that all those people who are getting eliminated, I think there's a lot, there are still people who are surviving. Um, and usually it's the people who do still have those skills and are able to still do the technical stuff. Um, but also the people who show high growth. You know, the people that get eliminated the quickest, trip over the extension cord there, that might have been ugly. Um, the You're going to own the source conference next year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or the hotel, one or the other. True. Um, or both. <laughs> the, the people who are getting eliminated quickest are the people who are coasting, the people who have stopped growing, who have stopped learning, who are just sort of sitting there. Um, you know, the people who have, who have, we were talking about earlier, you know, who have given the, what, would, what did you say? Here's your revolver, sir. Yeah, I mean, the people. Um, you know, the people who have really stopped trying are the people who are getting eliminated quickest. Um, and what's really unfortunate about it is that um, we as humans have 
the tendency to, nobody can see my slides, awesome. We, we as humans have the tendency to not prepare for things. You know, oh, it's not gonna happen to me. We're all in this massive denial, like I'm not gonna be the one that's gonna get eliminated and have to worry about how to pay my mortgage. It won't be me, but. And, and that's very true, is that, you know, people always believe it's always happening to the other guy. You know, it's, it's happening to the other person. Um, you know, I, I'm an information security professional. Our industry is the hottest industry in the world. There are not enough people to do the jobs. Everybody needs information security people. You know what? When companies are laying 10% of their workforce off, when 15%, when a company cuts 20,000 people and it's 15% of their workforce, I guarantee you that if they have 10 information security people, that anywhere between one and three of those people are losing their jobs. Yeah. If not more. Yeah, in some cases more because there's lots of consulting companies out there that can take some of that load. Um, you know, it's good for us who are in consulting. I mean, we have, we have the opportunity to take on some of that load from companies. And there are still some consulting companies hiring for that, for that very reason. Um, but uh, unfortunately, all those people in that job probably didn't think it was going to be them. You know, and they, they weren't prepared. And they're probably very surprised when it did happen. Yeah, no kidding. Um, you know, locking the barn door after the horse is closed or after the horse is stolen is a, it's a little late um, because you can really, un unfortunately, you can prepare for it, you know, or fortunately, you can prepare for it. Um, and even if it doesn't affect you, you can push it out as long as possible. I mean, the goal. Uh, I like to use the uh, I like to use the hurricane metaphor. I mean, the goal is not necessarily to keep the the uh, hurricane from blowing your house down, it's to make sure that it doesn't get all your stuff too. You know, it's to make sure that you have managed to protect your assets, um, that you've done everything that you can to shore up the foundation, and that you are able to put yourself in a situation that even if it hits you, um, you survive it and you come out as little damaged as possible. Um, we said that there's basically five steps. Um, you can cut and you can slice and dice these however you see fit, but um, I, I don't think there's any question that we think that planning is the first step. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I, there was, uh, Mike said something about, um, it was something about coincidence or, um, I, but I, I like this one, you know, uh, you know Branch Rickey, uh, you know, luck is the residue of opportunity and design. You know, and the truth of the matter is, is that when things come together, you know, they always seem to come together for a reason. You know, it's, uh, there's no accident why people, you know, put themselves at the right place at the right time. You know, some of it is happenstance, but, you know, a lot of it is because, you know, someone's open to opportunity and when opportunity knocks, you know, they're able to answer that call. So, you know, when we talked about it in the first hour, you know, you're talking about, you know, understanding what your career plan might be and really trying to think about you know the direction that you know you want to head into and 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 planning accordingly um, you know you have to think about you know where is the skill set matrix that you want to develop and then how to figure out you know how do I incorporate the things that I'm doing both you know professionally and personally into that plan per se I, and I think a, a, you know, the key to a good plan is to have it be both reasonable in the short term and long term. I, I see people planning and they, they write like a task list of things to do for the next 30 days. That's not a plan. That's a task list. You know, if your plan doesn't go out at least a year or two, it's not a plan. Um, it, because it's really hard, and I said it earlier about my own, my own life, it's really hard to keep yourself focused in the chaos if you don't know what your end goal is. Um, if I just know that I want to take three steps, that's fine, but I could be walking three steps in the wrong direction. You know, you, it's, Tony Robbins always says something about, you, you don't get, it's like uh, saying that your goal is, uh, is to see a sunset and running east. You know, it, it, it's <laughs> like you, if you don't tie the short term to the long term, you're never going to get there. It's just a task list. But also, and, and we'll talk more about this later, but the worst thing that, I've, that we see a whole lot is people who have a career plan that doesn't take into account their whole lives. Um, especially when you have a career crisis. Um, if you don't know who you want to be 
and in more than just your life, in your, your relationships, in your friendships, in your family, when you lose your job, you lose your whole plan. And I'll tell you, there's nothing more life-destroying than losing your whole plan, than having no reason to live, you know, than having no defined idea of where you're going and what you're going to do. Um, so it's important that a plan has more than just you know, what you want to do on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, like here, like, I mean, you know, people talk about planning, right? I mean, you know, there's an expression that, you know, we plan, God laughs, right? That's, that's the expression. I, I don't know if everybody ever heard that before. But, you know, I mean, there's always like, you know, a, you know, a, a method, you know, a, a method to the madness. Um, you know, in this discussion, you know, beforehand, since everybody was here, people talk about like following their passion and following their, you know, their, their goals and their dreams and stuff like that and, you know, doing things that really interested or things that they're passionate about. I mean, you know, I think that when you start incorporating, you know, whatever plan that you make, you have to incorporate those passions. You incorporate your life passions into that work. You understand that, you know, the things that are going to be important for you as you navigate toward those goals. Um, you know, the world that we live in, you know, if you're in that monster dot com driven world where you know, I, it calls all the time, can you send me the job description? You know what? I, it's the worst thing that people can really think about it because really the best job descriptions are the ones that you kind of create on your own. Because like you should be developing your job description once you get there day one. You shouldn't worry about what you're called or who you report to or how things go in that environment. You should be worrying about, is it possible for me to make the most of this opportunity? Am I going to have an opportunity to succeed? Are people going to be able to, you know, let me kind of push my ideas and explore what I want to do? And is it going to be a framework of an environment that I'm going to be feel comfortable showing up 55, 60 hours a week in doing this work? Um, you know, so, I, you, you should very much be not so much worried about you know what somebody else thinks the job t to be. What you should be thinking about is that what do you want your job to become? How and is it possible for you to take this job or this opportunity and mold it in a way where it benefits your long-term plan? And if you can then I think it's a good thing to be able to think about and look at. And I think it's one of the criteria when you start evaluating opportunity about, you know, you know where you might want to be. You know where you might want to get to. Does this fit in the, does this help elevate you to that area? And, that's, this, and that's where um, having mentors is really helpful. Because one of the things you can ask yourself or people around you is, who else has done this? You know, I'm, I, who else has taken a job like this and made it successful in this way? You know, who else has, who else can I follow? It's always, it's always easier to follow someone else's footsteps and avoid the mistakes they made than to make the mistakes yourself, you know? So, so like, like, give me an example. Like, if you, were, if you were an accountant, you know, get the revolver again. But if you were an accountant, right, and, and you wanted to be a CFO, there is a very structured career plan to become a chief financial officer at a big company, a small company, because the accounting profession's been around for a long time. I love to pick on accountants, right? If you ask the 100 information security info, you know, chief information security officers or information security leaders at whether it's software companies or corporations, if you ask them how they got there, they would probably give you I would probably venture somewhere between 75 and 90 different career paths to get there. Now, one of the things that you might want to think about is that how do you look at the ones that have developed that career path and have achieved some sort of level of success that you emulate or that you might aspire to, to achieve one day? You might think about, well, what did they do? What were some of the steps along their way? Or maybe pick two or three of them and figure out some of the things that they did. Maybe as early as education, maybe as early thing as conferences, maybe anything about um, the types of organizations that they've worked in, how they rounded out their experiences. So try to, pick, you know, there's enough of a data sampling after 10 to 15 years of this industry really being relevant that you can actually, some of those examples do exist. So I think it's important when you look at that, 
you know, you start selecting people that you might want to kind of mold yourself after and find ways to approach them, find ways to be in the same room as those people. And, you know, hopefully some of them are approachable. And hopefully some of them will get, you know, to get you to, you know, help, help guide you to where you might want to be. Um, the one thing I'll say about planning, it's sort of a bit of a digression, but it's important to know, um, every plan has risk, right? Every plan cuts off something, you know. Um, like Lee was telling his story earlier about working for the Dodgers and then um, becoming an information security recruiter. He couldn't be both an information security recruiter, recruiter and the GM of the LA Dodgers. You can be one or the other. You know, you, you can be a CISO or you can be a, a pastry chef. You probably can't be both, you know. Um, so every plan that you create is going to eliminate a whole lot of options in your life. That means sacrifice. Um, I, can, I can run my own thing and I can run my own business, but it means a lot less sleep and a lot less time playing Xbox. Is that worth it? To me, yeah. Um, is that worth it to some people? Not so much. Um, the, the whole thing is you have to, when doing a plan, take into account what you're giving up. You know, if you want to be a high-end consultant and consult around the world, that doesn't work so well if you want to stay home 300 days a year. You only get one choice. You can, you can do one or the other. You can't be sort of pregnant. Yeah. Very much so. I mean, you know, you a, it's 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 one of those things where you know, you know, when people start thinking about their career choices, right? I mean, there's a certain level of sacrifice and everything. And as you progress throughout your life, you have different levels of things that you're willing to give up. Um, when I was 23 and 24 years old, if you wanted me to get on a plane and go anywhere, I'm in. Now it's a little bit different. You know, I have more responsibility. I have a young child at home. You know, it's um, you know, a lot of cases that, you know, for me, before my son was born, I would work till 8 o'clock, you know, in my office, no matter what. Now I kind of be like, you know, maybe it's not that important. I mean, those are different things that I personally have gone through, but, you know, um, they're different things. You know, um, I've probably adjusted the, the scope of what I envision my business to become um, and, and, and kind of like how my business operates and the mechanics of that. Um, as I've grown and as I've, you know, had more experiences. I mean, that's part of my own plan. Um, you know, I mean, there's so many different things that happen, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with adjusting your plan. Your plan should be adjusted, right? You should always revisit that plan because what happens is this, is that, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's like a, a breathing organism. You know, it's, it should be dynamic. You know, you should be able to, mold it and shape it and go back and you know you might veer off in the direction you might come back you know you can go a lot of different ways but understand that you should never lose sight of those long-term focus but recognize the fact that every for everything that you're trying to get out of something there is normally some sacrifice and then you have to weigh the fact is the sacrifice worth the reward and sometimes you sacrifice and the reward doesn't materialize. And you have to be, you have to be willing to make, to make the leap anyway. And that's risk. That is risk. There, that is risk. There, there is always going to be risk. Um, and so enough talking. Let's have them do an exercise. Um, you didn't know this was going to be interactive, but uh, we're, this is not just for us to talk about because this isn't about us. You know, we can talk at you for an hour, but you guys doing a plan is far better than us talking. So take all the pieces of paper or your laptop or whatever. Um, take five minutes. Answer these questions. The, the point is to get an idea of the current state of your life and where you think about yourself going. I'm going to do it too.
It's getting beamed up. <laughs> it's probably your cell phone. You're right next to the thing. Give it about another minute. Pencils down. I'm <laughs> <laughs> All right, so as you read that over, positive or negative? Happy with where you're going? Generally? Um, that's a good way to get yourself in the mindset of examining where you are and where you're going. Um, the next step from there is goal setting, both short term and long term. Um, I generally like to have this set of plans for my life. Um, that's me. I'm a bit of a planner. Mike's got this look on his face like, are you serious? Um, Anything more than two to five minutes now, it's all. <laughs> and, and thank you. That's the perfect segue to what I was about to say. Dude, serious. Thank you. You should be my like cue cards or something. Um, anything more than two to five years is less about what I want to do than who I want to be. Who do I want to be when I'm 60 years old, for example? What kind of life experiences do I want to have had? What kind of things do I want to have done? What kind of impact do I want to have had on the world? You know, whether it's as a parent, whether it's as the people around me. Um, it, it's sort of the same exercise as, as you see it in some of the cheesier old self-help stuff. Like, what do you want it to say on your tombstone? Who do you want to have been 30 years from now? Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff. Bernie <laughs> Madoff. Yes. Um, I wouldn't turn it down. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like one of those. Uh, one of the, leave the country. Right, exactly. He, he stayed in, in the country just a couple days too long there. Um, but to me, these are the actual actionable plans. These are the, you know, anything from sort of one to two years. Those are the things you're going to make decisions on on a daily basis. But are you being consistent with who you want to be 50 years from now, 30 years from now, um, 20 years from now? I don't, I don't plan past sort of the age of 60. Um, for those who don't know, I'm 32. So I, I sort of set that longest term at, at 60. I can't imagine who I'm going to be as a senior citizen. I can't imagine what that phase of my life will look like. 60 is the new 40. Though. 60 is the new 40, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but I can imagine. That's how I want to be <laughs> transitioning from that point. I can't imagine who I will want to be at that jumping off point. Um, you know, you may have a different, a different plan. I, I put this list to someone who was in her um, mid-50s, and she wrote back and told me that she couldn't imagine what life at 85 would be. You know, and, and you guys, uh, being sort of 10 years younger than me, might have a hard time imagining what 60 looks like. So you have to find the list for yourself. You have to find the set that, you're, that you can create a vision for. But at the same time, having that vision for who you want to be at that point gives you an anchor for all the decisions you make in the next two to five years. Right? If, if they're completely inconsistent, you have a problem. If you say, at 30, I want to run a Bertie Madoff-like or Ponzi scheme, 
or sorry, at 30, I want to be a wonderful person, but you're setting up your Ponzi scheme, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. The year one, plan Ponzi scheme. <laughs> <laughs> Years one through 29, bilk investors out of money. Exactly. <laughs> year 30, leave to Antigua. <laughs> Call Stanford up and make plans. <laughs> The thing is, it has to be consistent, and, and the longer-term plans will give you an idea of how you can peg your current activities to who you ultimately want to be. Um, that said, at the same time, we want you to prepare for contingencies, and I'm not going to have you stop and do this exercise, but grab the slides off of, um, off of my website afterwards. One of the things that I think is really important when you're talking about bad economic times is to know what situation you'd be in if you went with that income now. What is your runway? I mean, ultimately, if you lost your job today, how long could you manage to continue to pay the rent and keep food on the table? Um, most Americans, the answer is none. You know, most Americans, I, I think, this, what was the savings? You would know this, the savings rate for the last two years. Well, it, 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 it just, it's funny, the, the savings rate in America was actually, it was a negative savings rate for, just yeah. this last quarter, savings rate actually went up to a positive direction, and that's just basically a result from the fear. I don't have the, you know, the numbers, it's like, you know, in decimal points and stuff like that, but, you know, I mean, that's a big, you know, a, a big scenario. Why people are saving now is the people who still do have jobs are saving because they're saying, well, if it happened to Joe down the street or if it happened to Mary, it can happen to me. So you have that type of, you know, you know, so you have that type of scenario. Like, you, you know, it, it, when you look at it, right, like, so you think about, you know, you, you, you the term like runway, right? You know, that's a, that's a VC term, right? That's, a, that's how venture capitalists talk about their their portfolio companies, or they talk about burn rate and that type of stuff. You know, you got to figure out. Run. You know, look at your look at your enterprise of you Inc. as you know, you're your venture capitalist. You're your your that's your that's your startup. That's your your funding. And then you know, how am I going to raise capital? I mean, that's really kind of a way I'm going to do it. And and where are my marketable skills that are going to be able to get me to raise capital? But you know, you start thinking about like. You know, this is much different when you're 20 years old versus when you're 30 years old versus when you're 40 years old versus when you're 50 years old. So, you know, this exercise, you know, if you look at this, I mean, you know, I mean, most people, if you listen to Susie Orman, who I like, actually, uh, I think she's very good. Um, she, you know, she said that most people should have six months worth of, worth of savings. Now, if you told me when I was 23 years old that I have six months worth of savings, all I really would need would be $400 in somebody's couch, and that would have been enough <laughs> for me, right? But you know, you tell me now that I need six months worth of savings, you know, I got more responsibilities, so I got to think more about that. So you have to think about like what that really means to you, and then you also think about you know how would how, you know how easy it is to replace that. Now, tying this all in, we're talking about money because I think money is really important for people to think about. Um, it's one of these things where the more responsible you are in your financial life, the better decisions you can make for your career because you wind up able to take jobs because you want to take them, not because you have to take them. So you should think about that. I know that you know things are expensive and stuff like that, but all those little months of personal sacrifice, you know, do I go out to dinner how many times a week or you know, go out with your friends, the bar bill's $100, you're like, hey, no problem, whatever, I'm making good money now. That stuff comes back to hurt you. I bet there are a lot of people right now that if they could take back, you know, some of the quote unquote good times and experiences that they had and they look at, you know, the world staring them at their face and say, you know what? You know, maybe, you know, I had a good time, but, you know, that time's over. Um, I'm not saying, you know, don't, have, don't enjoy your life. I'm saying is that there are consequences for those actions and that your career is one of those casualties because you put, your situ you put yourself in a situation where you become vulnerable. And so that's why, you know, I think it's important if you can start thinking about it now that you think about, well, how do you plan for the what if because the what if looks a lot different if you don't have to worry about how am I going to keep the lights on. Yeah, no question. I, and I encourage everybody to do that exercise, but we're not going to stop and do it right at this moment. Um, it's worth doing. 
I, step two is to really take the time to work on your career and not in it. Um, this is a sort of rip off of something that Michael Gerber said um, in his book, The E-Myth. He talked about entrepreneurs fail because they spend all their time working in their business and not on it. Um, they spend, for example, me, I spend all my time pen testing and not enough time dealing with my accountant because I'm good at pen testing. And it's natural for me to do a pen test. It's natural for me to work on that stuff. And me talking to an accountant is like a fish trying to talk to an elephant. It just, it doesn't make. I don't speak elephant. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> uh, and I don't speak accountant. You've seen me with a spreadsheet. Yeah, they're not good. Um, <laughs> me with a spreadsheet is not good. Um, this lesson really applies to your career, though. Most people are not good at working on their career at spending the time planning, at spending the time figuring out what their strengths and weaknesses are, um, finding coaches, working on figuring out what training you need. I, I had a great employee at one point who blew my mind and really showed me the, uh, the benefit of this. Um, we were preparing for his annual review, and he sent me his training plan for the year. Um, unsolicited. I hadn't asked anybody for a training plan. He sent me a training plan, and I thought I was going to find, like, Take class, you know, or like one line. Uh-uh. 50 objectives for his own learning for that year, one, or 52, one a week. Um, in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet with like tracking and the whole thing. Blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. But that's a guy who, since I hired him, has gone on to create, um, basically, he's got his own company that he's running on the side. He's had two really awesome vulnerability research jobs that he could have probably told me he was going to take those jobs off that plan because all of the plan was organized towards taking, taking, preparing himself for those two jobs. Um, not many of us do that. Not many of us have an idea about what our career needs to look like and have a plan for the future. Um, so. What I find as a really good way to start is to, do a, is to do a gap analysis. To write your own job description, not just the things that you do on a daily basis, but all the skills that you really need to be successful in what you currently do. Um, and then figure out which things you're missing. What things, if you had them, would you be better at um, your job if you had those skills right now. And basically perform a gap assessment like you would for an organization doing an information security program um, on your own career and your own skills. I have always used the, um, the portfolio model for human capital as the background of any of these assessments that I do. Um, this portfolio model was, it's funny, it was something I took from a Harvard Business Review article when they were talking about assessing human resources strength. And it was uh, HBR in 2006, May 2006 to be precise. Um, and basically they said that there were five different types of skills. And I actually added the last one because I like the idea of talking about what weirdness you bring to, an, to something. But there's your technical skill, which as an accountant is math and knowing the laws and all that kind of stuff. And as a security person is obviously real technical skill. I put it in quotes because when I'm talking to security people, we think technical skills means you're a CIS, you know, you're a CISSP. That's not technical, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and actually, a CISSP is technical for a security manager. You know, those are the technical skills of a security manager's job. Um, there's also your strategic skill, which is your ability to see the industry as a whole. Um, there is your industry knowledge, which is your knowledge of what's actually going on. When I say strategic skill, I mean more about um, directing yourself within the industry, understanding how what you do technically fits into what the market needs, and just knock my own microphone off, and what the market has going on, you know, what it'll be in the future. For example, um, you could call it strategic to say that I knew a couple of years ago that social engineering would be interesting um, or I was coming lucky. up in the future. Or I was lucky, but I actually <laughs> did it as a plan. Um, relationship skills. You know, how are you at building a network, at, at maintaining that, and has said to me at different times that the best job you ha that you can have is the one you currently have. Um, because of, and it's entirely because of this. You have built a portfolio of knowledge and a portfolio of effectively capital 
through the political relationships you have in your organization and through your knowledge of their processes. This is a skill that you have that when you move to a new organization, this gets reset to zero almost, almost in every case. Um, so whereas you might have all of this to be successful in your job, if you need that to be successful in your job, starting in a new company could be very difficult. Yeah, that, that's, that's a huge mistake that people make is that you know, the value that, you know, um, the value that they've assessed to their skill or where they've moved up in the organization is because they know how to things, you know, get things done. Like, uh, anybody see Shawshank Redemption? You know, so Red, you know, the guy in the prison, he, Morgan Freeman says, you know, I'm the guy around here who can get things. You know, on the outside, everybody can get things. He's not really that valuable guy. But in that prison, he's a guy who can get things. So you have to think about, like, you know, it, it, when you work in a company, and normally this happens in larger, bigger, multinational companies, if your value is the fact that you can get, you know, Sally in accounting and Bill in HR and, you know, this one in commercial markets to all kind of embrace the security program and stuff like that, because your kids play, you know, Little League with Sally's kids and you go golfing with Bill and you play poker with John, if that's the case, that's fine. But if the reason that you're good at getting their buy-in is because you're an excellent presenter, you make compelling arguments and those types of things, you know, that person has some real other skills. The person who's, you know, that internal capital that goes out the window, you know, that goes out the window when you start. So people, they overplay their hand in that way. They overplay their value because they don't under, they, they fail to realize that their value has become one that is within the walls of their environment is big, but outside their environment is very minimal. So, and I think in a lot of times that those people are the ones that really have a, a very difficult time, you know, in actually adapting when change happens. The company gets bought, somebody acquired, they bring in, they promote somebody over, and over the person and stuff like that, and then the person winds up kind of lost. So you have to think about that because it just shows that the other skills are skills that you can control and are valuable on the outside. But that company's specific knowledge is really, truly only valuable as long as you stay. Um, and I've seen a lot of times when people, they say, oh, I want to leave and go somewhere. They go somewhere, and then they realize, like, wait, I, I want to go back. I, I, I want my old job back. And by that time, it's too late, you know? So it's... Um, it's one of those things where, um, you know, you have to really think about that, you know, and you have to really work on the skills. You know, when you're doing these things, you start thinking about two types of marketability. It was on a slide before, but your internal marketability, it was one of the questions you asked, is, is your internal marketability and your external marketability. Your internal marketability is always about politics and, 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 and who do you get along with and how people think of you and your, your brand of, you know, are you the person who comes to meetings on time? Are you the person who always gets things done? Are you the person that comes up with great ideas? Are you the person who really follows through? Your external brand is, hey, if I didn't work here, what would people really think of me? If the company, if, if, we, got, if we got Lehman the next day, where would I go and who would hire me? And I think that's kind of how you think about it. Also playing into the, that same sort of brand is your weirdness quotient. Um, we were talking about a, a friend of ours today. And Lee, we were talking about a potential opportunity that he could take. And Lee said to me, um, yeah, but that company is, a, what was it? It, it? That company, they all looked like they just stepped out of a Brooks Brothers catalog. <laughs> and our friend, you said, I, I believe you said, he's totally a farm guy. Yeah, I mean, that's, he's, that's, a rural, he's a rural guy. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, and he is. It was the perfect description. That's what Weirdness Quotient is about. I mean, I, I know that if I'm in an organization that requires me to wear a suit every day, I'm not going to survive. Um, I also know people who, if they were in an organization that let them wear T-shirts all the time, they wouldn't know what to do with themselves, Right. So, but look, look, wait, look, I want to interrupt you. Yeah, really no. Quick. So let me pose this question for you. So, and it's a good, it's you know, this is a, it's a good topic, right? Like, you know, well, what happens if they made me wear a suit and tie every day? You know, well, would you be willing to sacrifice the suit and tie every day if it was able, it, it enabled you to achieve 
50 or you know five or six things that helped you get to your long-term career goal and that's always the sacrificial question right um I, it's funny because i and i want to Go ahead, we I'm we sorry. should answer that. No, we should answer that question, but I, I think it's a personal question. But I, I, I sort of have a tendency to talk about weirdness quotient in terms of, um, in very much in terms of appearance, because it's easy to see weirdness quotient. It's not so easy to see weirdness quotient in terms of action. But that's actually probably much more impactful. I can put on a suit, I can never not be me. You know, I can never not be the guy that always asks questions in a meeting. I can never not be the person who asks particularly annoying questions most of the time. Um, I'm never going to be micromanageable. I if you micromanage me, bad things happen on both sides. Um, when, when, when animals attack. <laughs> yes, very much so. It's, it's, like a, it's like an Animal Planet episode. Um, those are all part of my uniqueness. They're part of who I am and how I'm different. In some organizations, that is appreciated, loved, and rewarded Brace. well. In some organizations, they would want to throw me out the fourth floor window. The Brooks Brothers people. Yes, the Brooks Brothers people would hate me. Knowing this about yourself is one of the, in my view, is one of the fundamental skills for understanding your ability to be successful anywhere. Um, while everyone spends all their time career planning around this, and a couple of people spend some time talking about these two, and you read the touchy-feely networking people that talk about this one, you almost never hear about these two. And to me, most of your success is in these two. It's in figuring out what you know about the company that allows you to get things done, and in who you are, and why that's acceptable where you are. Um, those things are going to be probably the most difficult to assess, but the most valuable ones to have a valid assessment of. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I, here, here's a question, and people, um, this is a great question, and since we're kind of a young group, I feel very comfortable talking about it. So older people are very, um, they're very um, nervous about putting all the years of experience that they have on their resume. They're very nervous about that. And I, say, I always say, the, the response I always say to somebody, I said, let me ask you a question. You take off the last 15 years of your resume, it looks like you've only worked for 12 or 13. When you walk into the interview, are you going to go down to, you know, you know drink a magic potion and turn into a 30-year-old when you walk into the office? You know? I said, so if they don't want to hire you because you're 55 years old, I said, wouldn't you rather know that before you schlep down to the interview and take the interview and stuff like that? If they don't like old people, would I want to work there? If they don't like people who are brown, who are blue, who are Jewish, who are Catholic, if they don't like you for who you are, don't hide that when you interview. Be yourself, because you'd rather find that out up front than find it out after you've been there for a month or so. There's, there's no, you have, you have to understand that once you wind up in that job, you are in that job. And then leaving that job becomes hard too. Well, why Johnny? Why were you only there for a month? What's wrong with your decision-making process? Didn't you know enough? I mean, people start questioning your judgment, you know, and that's a hard thing to deal with. And you can't say, yeah, well, I didn't want to work there because I found out they didn't like old people. Well, wait one second. <laughs> wait one second. You know, we have somebody here that doesn't like it. this. Is this is an HR suit waiting to happen? You know, it. There are all those types of things. So. Be yourself. You know, if you wear your hair long and you're unwilling to cut it and stuff like that, yeah, you might wear, you might make it neat, but if you have an environment that everybody has to, you know, that, that goes to the buzz cut guy every week, you don't want to be there. Col business culture is a lot more lax now than it, than it used to be. If you date back 10 years, there were a lot more suits and ties and stuff like that. Even their general business culture is a little bit more relaxed now, but you have to think about it. You have to think about, you know, is my uniqueness going to be embraced in this environment or is it going to be repelled? Because there's always going to be somebody that says, oh yeah, that's the, you know, that's the one with the, the tattoo of the spider on your neck, you know? That would creep me out. I'd have a hard time hiring, if somebody had a, you know, if I had somebody come to the interview with a turtleneck and the first day that they hired, there was a freaking black widow on their neck, that would freak me out. I had to say, look, we probably have to reevaluate this. I might be old fashioned, but, 
the idea of, I mean, like, but I would know, you know, if somebody didn't like that about me, I'd rather know that. I'd rather know. I, 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 I'd always would rather know. I would rather not dress it up. It, it's very, it's very easy to, you know, it's very, you can, you can fake something for a three hour interview. You can't fake something 40 hours. You'll want to pay to yourself. You know, you, you don't want to be, you put yourself in those situations. So, what? you know, understand, you know, you know thyself. I mean, it's, it's, it's really important. And beyond, beyond appearance, it comes out eventually. Mm -hmm. you know Always what? will. Especially in times of stress. I could probably fake being like, you know, nice and calm and demure and just shut my mouth and go along for a certain amount of time. But I'll tell you, when it's, you know, 2 a.m. and you've been at work for too long, that's when the real personality is going to come out. And you are eventually going to have that moment where if they, um, you know, my worst case scenario is that I enter a command and control environment where you don't speak unless spoken to. Um, you know, if you're the lowest man on the totem pole, you don't open your mouth. Um, I once had a boss tell me that uh, when I, I was older, I could have an opinion, but not until then. Um, and, and actually said this in front of many coworkers. This was not like a secret at that organization. Until you had been there for five or six years, if you didn't have, you know, until you've been there for five or six years, your job was to be quiet um, and, and speak only when asked for answers. Anybody who knows me, and you guys have been laughing through this whole conversation because you worked with me, anybody who knows me knows that that's not an environment I should be in. Because um, I can only fake that for so long before I go off on the guy. Um, strength and weaknesses. We talk, we talk about this all the time, but um, most people spend a lot of time worrying about what they're weak on. And that's really boring and frustrating. If I had to spend 80% of my time trying to improve my accounting skill, my business would suffer immensely, and I would suffer immensely. What you should spend your time working on is 80% of the time on your strengths, and 20% of your time on the weaknesses that matter. You know, when you do a gap analysis and you look at what skills do I actually need to be successful? Um, do I need to be an accountant to be successful in my business? Absolutely not. Do I need to know enough about accounting so that I can talk to an accountant about my business? Absolutely. And you should think about the skills that are, are, are critical for your long-term advancement. You know, you also look at the skills that not only what you think is important, but you also have to consider, you know, I, I use the term that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So you almost have to take that other person's perspective and think about what skills are going to be appeal, uh, appealing to someone who I might sit in front of one day, and, 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 and what are those skills that would make me um, make opportunities available to me. Um, and they might be things, um, they, they could be a number of different angles. I mean, they could be things like, um, you know, like I, I talk to, um, we do some recruiting for information security salespeople. Salespeople who are good golfers, golf is actually, an, believe it or not, it's an important skill in sales. Because, you know, someone says, hey, what's your handicap? And I, I, I don't know much about golf, except Tiger Woods is pretty good at it. But at the same point in time, you know, that could be an important skill in a sales environment because business is done on the golf course. I don't know. But it's one of those things where you should start, you know, you start thinking about like, well, what are the things that, and, and think outside. Think about, you know, who might be evaluating you one day and what are those things that would appeal to them? You know, what education, what certification? I mean, all these types of things that would, you know, that, that would have some, 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 value to that person who's ultimately going to have some, you know, in, uh, some say over your career and your career direction. Quickly, um, take about a minute to do this because we're running a little long. Um, just do this step. What are your three best strengths? Write them down. What are the things that make you most successful in your life? Just a hint, it's probably not your knowledge of any one protocol. It's probably a little bigger than that or programming language or anything like that. Well, that's mine. Actually. That is, that I'm, is I'm, yours. I'm a C++ guy. That's You're a guru. I'm a guru. Guru. I'm an expert. I would put that on my resume. Expert C. Expert. <laughs> expert. When I think of you, I told That's what I would think. Yeah. I've been trying to build that brand of mine. That expert. is your personal brand. You know that. So, that's good. When you think of Lee, think of C. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> plus, plus. <laughs> Is 
an intimate gathering today. It is. I like this. We can just be ourselves. We don't actually have to be talking. True. Um, once you've got that list, that's the list of things you need to be investing in. Um, how do those, those things will ultimately relate to probably your longer term plan because usually the things that you are best at are the things that you're going to enjoy the most. You know, the things that you, what, what they've found is that if you are really competent at something, it's usually more enjoyable to be successful at it than otherwise. Um, you know, I, I like breaking into things and I'm good at it and I'm good at it because I like it and I like it because I'm good at it. So it's at that point that you invest time and training and um, effort into all of this kind of learning. Um, you know, we talk about training and certifications a lot in this industry. Um, we talk less about formal education in this industry, but I, mean, I know you guys all have all really invested in formal security education. Um, you know, I have a degree in philosophy, which has nothing to do with the industry. Um, there's also atypical training. You may find that you want to do training that enhances your strengths in different ways. Um, I, th I think that that's part of it is that, you know, when you start thinking about, you know, your, your, your skill, right? I mean, you know, you know, where you wind up advancing in different places in your career, it's not so much about those, you know, standard skills that, you know, kind of, every, I mean, what are there, 55,000 CISSPs? Oh, uh, it's up over 100, isn't it? I, I, it's I don't getting close I don't, to 100. I don't think CIS, I think, C, I think that there's like 25,000 SAN certified folks, yeah. um, God knows how many um, SISMs. I mean, there are a lot of people that have very good certifications and things like that. But like, you know, a lot of those things, um, you know, you sort of think about like, you know, what about your public speaking or, you know, taking a sales class, um, like just something like spin selling or something like that. Or, or like, you know, people, you know, people talk about, you know, you guys are all pretty good at it, but like social networking aspects of, you know, of, 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 that's a skill of some point in time that corporations are thinking that's a lot more valuable, especially in like, you know, the recruiting process per se. Um, you know, there's time management might be something that could be very important to people. Um, uh, for me, when I started my business, the one thing that really came hard to me and it's something that I had to learn and really develop, um, and I did a lot more of us trial and error, was people management. I had a very difficult time with that. Um, just because I, my expectations were so high that everybody would be as dedicated as me as the business owner, which was completely a fallacy. But I mean, but you know, learning that and then learning how to deal with different people, managing young people is actually a lot more difficult than you know maybe managing older folks. Um, you know, there's so many different things that you have to think about. But you know, there is some type of training and education for a lot of things, and they also make for interesting talking points. They enable you to stand out. I think that when you start thinking about you know the investments that you make in your career, and we'll get to that a little bit more. I think it becomes about differentiation. I think that you know that's the really number one topic that I think is going to become huge in our industry over the next 10 or 15 years because we're going to become more and more populated. And we become more and more populated by nature, we're going to become more and more average. And because people are going to be more and more average, the more unique things that you have that people can attribute to you, whether they're any of those things or some of the things that I mentioned or some of the things that you build on your own, those things are going to be the differentiators and they'll be the ones that get you more notice and more recognition and give you the opportunity to present your case to somebody who might be able to you know, put you in a situation where you can accomplish your career goals. So you start thinking about these things and you start thinking about, well, which one is the right one? And you know, how do you evaluate them? And you know, I will say just very simple. I, here are my, this, this is my slide, right? So <laughs> any investment that you make in your career is a good one. It's true. You can't go wrong. People say, well, which certification should I get? Which is the right one? The truth of the matter is, any time that you're investing in yourself in any way, it's good. Because no matter what, you're going to reap the benefits of it. And when you make these investments, don't invest because of what it might get you. Invest in it because it's something that you truly want. Because it's something that you have an interest in. 
like a lot of people say, well, I'm going to get a CISSP because everybody has a CISSP. Well, you know what? You don't have to do that. If you want to, if some jobs one day might require a CISSP, you might want to get that on your own. You might, I mean, those are things. But, but no, nothing that you do in investing time and investing in yourself is a bad thing. The second thing is that you get what you pay for. I want you to just play one piece of word association game. If I told you that I had an MBA from Kellogg or Wharton or Tuck or Fuqua, we're good. Theoretically, yeah. Um, or Fuqua or any of the other bigger business schools. Or if I told you that I had an MBA from the University of Phoenix, that automatically, you know, the, the fact that you're in those schools, the fact that you have those types of things, automatically makes you more viable. And I'm not saying you have to get an MBA to be a smart person, but I'm just saying that that's a very good way to kind of differentiate those things. That said, hey, back to rule one. If all you can do is the University of Phoenix, it's better than nothing. That's true. But you might also think is that if the University of Phoenix costs you $20,000 a year to attend, you might think of a better way to spend that $20,000. Absolutely. So rule number three, if you don't invest in yourself, don't expect anybody else to. And the reason I say that is very simple, is that you have to take ownership for your own career. You can't say, well, I would have gone to that conference if my boss would have paid for it. Or I would have taken that training, but my company doesn't pay for that anymore. You have to think about things that are, you know, you have to do what you want to do. You know, corporations are going to become less and less vested in your own personal success. And as you see right now, travel budgets are getting slashed, training, everything discretionary is getting slashed. And unfortunately, training falls into discretionary. And the truth of the matter is a lot of companies think this, is that if I send my best people to training, that makes them more marketable and that makes it harder for me to retain them. So why would you want to be beholden to a company that would think that way? So you have to take that responsibility on yourself. You should be allocating a certain percentage of your, instead of investing in the stock market or some mutual fund and stuff like that, if you make those investments in your career over the length of time, I would prove that, I, I, I would almost stand to prove that even in standard scenarios that your career will accelerate a lot quicker, your earning potential will be magnified, and you have a better chance of achieving career happiness, which is more important than anything, I believe, than if you would just take that money and sock it away to a 401k plan and stuff like that. And I think the interest compounds better. Um, Seriously, I think the earlier you start, I mean, you guys have got it. You guys have got it made. I mean, if I had done half as much on security at the age you have, um, I would be so much better off than I am today. Because much like compound interest, the earlier you start on all of that advancement, the the more impact it's going to have when you're 40. You know, when you guys turn 40, you're going to be way ahead of where other people would be who started at 25, 26 even you know, earlier than that. Um, just because those first, co you know, anybody who's looked at the, the curve on compound interest, like what is the, you, you'll, you probably know this one, actually Steve, you probably know this one better than anybody. I, I don't remember the statistic, but like if you invest $5,000 at age 25, when or you- What I used to know uh, when, when I was self-employed is just doing my IRA on my own. Uh, 10% interest, a little bit high for now, but you know, that's historical stock market maturity since the Great Depression. Um, and uh, your $2,000 uh, IRA limit, which is now 6,000, if you if you get the you know 50-year one and 5,000 for everybody else, so you know you have more room to go. You start at age 25, by age 65, you have a million dollars. And that's just $2,000 a year. But it's because you started at 25. But, but the other stat I remember is if, if you put in 
that's what it is. If you put in five, uh, your maximum contribution from age 20 to 25, it ends up worth like a million five. But if you start at 30 and you put in your maximum contribution every year from then to 60, it's still less money than if you did just the five years at the beginning. Uh, and it's, it's that way with, with career investment too. Yeah, I the mean, earlier and the more you do it. But, but and, and, yeah. here's, and here's another piece that's important. It's not, and, and I think you can really kind of tie it into the whole financial models too. It's the consistent investment. It's the fact that the investments have to be made regularly. They can't just be made, well, hey, great, I'm going to do a whole bunch of things between when I'm 20 and 25, and I'll pick this back up again when I'm 40. The fact is, is that this is part of working on your career. Yeah. You know, and this is part of the fact that you, know, you have to work on your career. You have to develop your skills because th you know, when you get in a situation when you're competing against two or three other people for that job that you want, and you say, well, look, well, yeah, I know the other two candidates are CISSPs, and they've both worked in financial services environments and managed 15 people. But I do have this degree, and I've taken these five or six classes over the course, and I went on my own to get some management training. And you know, I, I'm a regular public speaker, and I'm very comfortable in that environment. And I've taken some sales classes, so I'm very familiar in convincing other folks and getting to where I need to be, that plus all my skill sets would make me different. And what you're looking for when you're in those situations of competition is differentiation. Because ultimately, we'll all compete. And here we are. Yeah, so Great segue. Yeah, there you go. It's like we planned that. Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, the, the time to brand yourself, of course, is yesterday. <laughs> really, not now. But it's impossible to brand yourself and differentiate when you're in the midst of a career crisis. You know, Lee always says it, and um, I even attributed it to him on the slide, um, no good decisions made under duress. Like, the day after you lose, the jo lose your job is not the time to think, I'm going to start a blog. Um, you know, maybe it'll help me get a job. It might help you get your next job, but it won't help you get a job right away. Um, same thing's true about networking. The time that most people network is after they've lost their job. And if anyone's ever been to a networking event, um, I'll say this, you know, from, from a dating perspective, um, being absolutely desperate is the one way to ensure you don't get a date. The same thing works with, works with networking. Mike knows a lot about I do. I know, I know all about that one. Um, I can't speak to that. That's Mike's area. Yes, so. <laughs> you, you, yes. You have, I, I like that. What we might have to steal that one. You what? have to have the employed glow in order to, to attract a new employer. Well, you know what they, you know what they say? This is, the, the, they say it on Wall Street a lot, and I'm using a lot of those quotes since I've been reading like more financial stuff nowadays. But they, the, 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 the statement or the expression is as if. And you know, walk into the room as if you own the place. You know, as if you have millions of dollars, as if this, as if that. You know, in other words, that employee, that exact, that employer, that, that air of confidence, the fact that, you know, if you can walk into a place and that, you know, you feel, you know, I always tell these folks that call my office that are a little bit down right now, and I said, look, when you go into the interview, you know what I want you to think about? I want you to think about when you had six or seven recruiters calling you every day and you didn't even want the phone call because you were happy in the job and that there was nothing that they could do to, to woo you away, but you took the interview anyway just to see what they might offer you. And you walk into that meeting and you know, you have a little swagger about you. You have a little bit of that air of confidence. There's a bounce in your step. You look sharp. You you're that employee glow, you know, you're happy. I mean, those things are important because it, it's, really, it's really the truth. I mean, you have to have that type of, uh, you know, people like to you know, be involved with positive people. They, they, it's just, it's more comfortable. It's, uh, it's more inviting, right? I mean, so, you know, that's a, when you talk about networking, right? Always network when you have a position of power. And we talk about network, and we're not going to get to all our slides in this scenario, but when, when you talk about networking, the problem is that people decide that I'm going to tap my network after, when, before it's too late. When you should be networking is that, when you should be networking, you should be networking 
when you have the ability to actually help other people. You know, your network is only good as if you have to call on it for something that it will respond and help you. If you ever say, well, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and I have thousand connections and blah, blah, blah. Who cares? But if you have 50 connections and they're all useful and you could call them up at a drop of a note and you know you're going to get a response back the next day and that's all, you know, that, that's all going to be all well and good, that's meaningful. And especially if there are 50 people who have the ability to kind of A, hire you, B, you know, say, hey, look, you know what? I, I, I'm not looking, but I know Joe, who's got a similar company to me. He's looking, he called me up the other day looking for a guy just like you. Let me get Joe on the phone. Joe, I want you to talk to Mike. Mike's looking for a job. I'd hire him right now, but not, boom, you're employed like that. That is real. That is very, very real. I mean, so you have to think about when you're, when you're doing good, when you're flying high, when things are good for you, that's when you build your network. And always make sure that when you're networking people, you give back. You should be giving more than you're getting and that people should say like, wow, that's great. Because you should be able to be accessible. Because think about it, just because if you're networking up, somebody underneath you is, wor is networking up as well. So you should think about it the same exact way because you never know when knowing that person who's a little bit junior to you is going to help you out get to where you need to be. So, you know, the world's become a lot small, but thinking about networking from when you're in a position of strength, not when in a position of weakness, because that, that desperate, you know, the desperate guy at the dance, man, whew, not attractive, not yeah. attractive. Well, and that's, that's most networking events. That's why I talk about networking events. Oh my so. God, you ever go to one of those job fairs? It's yeah. Like, it's like a freaking mash unit. Oh my yeah, God, it's, it's horrible. It's a whole bunch of, it, it, it's, like, it's like the really bad 40 and over singles bar. I mean, it, it, you know. Bad it, suits, bad tie, it, no hair. I yeah, mean, the whole it's nine yards. just not happening. Um, and, and I really believe what's on this slide. I mean, I think ultimately, you know, we talk a lot about branding and, you know, how to get people to know you, but ultimately your network is your brand. Um, the people you know determine who you are. And the people who know you determine who you are. Um, it's all about finding cool people. If you are, it's, uh, unfortunately, high school had it right. Life is never much more than li like it was in high school. If you hang out with the cool kids, you by definition become one of them. You, you are by definition cool. And if you hang out with the losers, you are by, defini by definition a loser. Unf you know, luckily for probably everyone in this room, um, the definition of cool and loser gets flipped around a lot after high school ends. I, lo so I, I love those t There's a t-shirt that I see at all the cons. Really? That's, um, it, 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 it's something that reflects that statement and, and it's really, I mean, it's really, it's, it's really funny that way. I mean, it, and it's not like, no, I won't fix your computer, but it's, it's like, re it's, it's really good. And, and, it, and it makes a lot, you know, it, it does make a lot of sense. Yeah, that, in high school, I was, you know, everybody was much cooler than me, but now we all get to be cool, at least in our own little conference. I don't know if. But, but you know what, you know, so, so I have an expression in my office, right? Like, you know, if you find me one rock star, like here, Lenny just left the room, so I, I don't have to embarrass him, right? So um, Ed Scotus is a longtime friend of mine. And um, so Ed Scotus calls me on the phone probably about three, like three, it was probably about four or five years ago, he calls me on the phone. And Ed never, I mean, I talk to Ed a lot, but we don't, he never recommends anybody. And he calls on the phone, he goes, Lee, I want you to talk to somebody. He's graduating from, I think it's MIT or, Harvard, one of those schools, he's getting his master's. He's a really great guy, I want you to help him out. And Ed Scotus calls me up and he says, look, you know, if Ed Scotus calls me up and he tells me he recommends somebody, I guarantee you that that person's going, I, I, I don't have to check another reference, I don't have to check another thought process, I know that just because I know Ed Scotus, and Ed's saying that this guy's great at what he does, that's good enough for me. So if you find me one rock star, you're gonna find me 10 rock stars. If you find me one turkey, you're gonna find me 10 turkeys. And that's the way it is. So that whole kind of, you know, cool friends, cool you, that's about like developing your peer circle. I, you, you had a slide in one of our other presentations talking about like, um, 
you know, that in your network of, you know, in your 10, what is it, your, your oh, it was, it was on that slide just a few minutes ago. Here the it is. Slide. This is it. Oh, subliminally. That, this is, it's very interesting because I think that's a very true slide. Statistics show that your income is overwhelmingly likely to be 10% of the average of your five closest friends. Good. Yeah, that should be weight. Weight is socially contagious. Sorry, bad cut and, re you know, uh, find and replace operation. Um, yeah, Harvard recently suggested that the same sort of, um, the same sort of statistical average holds around weight. You know, that your weight is likely to be within 10% of the average of your, I think it was your 10 closest friends or something like that. It's, it's, ver it's very interesting, but like, it's all, I call it guilt by association. Um, but it's also like, you know, and that's like what your network is. You know, your network is, is that, you know, oh wait, you know, Mike's friends with Adam O'Donnell. Okay, cool. Adam's a good guy, you know, that type of deal. You know, like, it's like, it I- It only works well that way though. You meet one cool person and if you become friends with them, next thing you know, you're friends with everyone. And that's how it was for me here last year at Source. You meet one cool person, next thing, you end up knowing everybody. Well, that's because you get invited to the cool people parties. Exactly. But I, and but it works for hiring too. I just had an interview last week and the president told me what he likes to do is find one smart person and then raid their entire friend group. Mm -hmm. yeah, smart but, president. But, 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 but you know, but there's, there's also, there's an interesting scenario on that, right? Like, so my, my, one of my philosophies in recruiting is that it's always easy to recruit one. The first one's always easy. The second, third, and fourth is always difficult because there only can be one stellar opportunity. So you can always present one stellar opportunity, but the second, third, fourth, and fifth players are automatically going to be at some point a little bit later to the party. Do you know what I'm saying? So you have to think about that because, and then you also start about like dealing with social networks, right? So think about your social networks, right? I mean, how many people are your friends is the term on, Facebook, right? I mean, or, or LinkedIn, right? I mean, how, how do you dis define who you accept invitations for, right? And then what kind of pictures are posted of you? I mean, that's a whole nother thing. Yeah, that's but a whole like, other topic. I mean, but you have to think about like all those types of interaction points where it's like, you know, what is your network saying about you? I mean, you could have like one dirty bird, like you could have like one guy that like, you know, I, I've had some weird stuff. I've had some, like my recruiters will talk to a number of people, and they're very friendly. Um, you know, and they'll you know invite people to their network, and I'm you'd be like, why are we network with that person? And they'll be like, well, you know, they were real nice to me and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, but you know, they have a real horrible reputation, and there's a lot of things. I said, look, I said, you know, check with me first. You know that type of stuff. And it's not so much to check with me on every person, but it's very scenarios that you know. If you lie down with bad dogs, you'll get fleas. I mean, and you have to think about that when you're building your network. Think, you know, don't take everybody's opinion, verb you know, verbatim, but listen, you know, you know, everybody, a lot of people have opinions in this industry and stuff like that, but, but think about kind of that whole association and stuff like that. So, I mean. Switching gears. Yeah, I mean, we could talk, I mean, we could talk for hours about but, each of these topics. But yeah, but I mean, and we could. T I mean, I think that we're basically out of time and stuff like that on this. I want to go through a couple of things in the ahead. incident response section because I think there's, with everything going on right now, there are a lot of people in that sort of, I need to get a job, um, right now sort of thing. And and the worst case scenario of anyone who goes through a career incident is to go into that 90 day. I call it the 90 day mope. Like you lose your job, and you don't know what to do with yourself and you don't know what to do, and 90 days later you're sitting around playing Xbox and um, you know, eating, eating donuts, Cheetos. eating Cheetos, exactly, <laughs> and, and flipping channels all afternoon. And that's how you can certainly ensure that you're not going to get anything quickly and ensure that you're going to have the worst time of it possible. So, like I said, I'm gonna go through this like lightning. If you have questions, you can ask about them afterwards. First step in dealing with a career um, career incident is emotional response. Everyone has an emotional response to a job loss. Job loss is one of the three most stressful events in your life. Moving and loss of a loved one are the other two. Divorce. Um, divorce, death, <laughs> either one. Um, and, and actually, I'm gonna, write, I'm gonna write a paper or a blog about this at some point when I have a few extra minutes, but um, uh, job loss is very much like a divorce. 
And so there are lots of books out there on, on breaking up. Kubler-Ross's um, book on death and dying talks about the grieving cycle. We go through all of the normal grieving cycle when we lose a job. You know, the first one is denial. Oh, it'll be okay. Everything, everything's going to be fine. You know, it, it's just a job. Then you get angry. Then, you know, you, you know, just, just, let me, just let me pay the bills this month and it'll be okay. Um, depression. And then finally, acceptance. If you really want to do this well, set yourself a depression timeline. Um, I like the rule of 12 years for every year that you had the job. 12 years? Sorry, 12, <laughs> sorry, 12 hours. <laughs> yes, you're going to be grieving for a I'll long see time. You when no, I'm sorry. 90. <laughs> 12, 12 hours for every year you had the job. So if you had the job for, um, for five years, you get two and a half days to sit around the house, mope, eat Cheetos, be depressed, cry, throw things, scream, the whole thing. And you give yourself a timeline. At the end of that time, you're done. No more of that kind of behavior. But everyone goes through it, so you have to accept it. The, the worst case scenario, and what usually causes the 90-day mope, is you get stuck here. You get stuck in, everything's going to be fine, and then you just don't do anything, because everything's going to be fine. You know, it'll all work out. It's that sort of like the secret thing. If I, if I manifest hard enough, another job will show up. Yeah, no, it won't. Um, so, the work. But the secret of the secret is that if it didn't work, you didn't try hard enough. So oh, okay. that's why it's the secret. All right, and like I said, I'm running through this, but I want to get these slides done. Um, fundamentals are really important. In the first 72 hours, you're going to get presented with a billion pieces of paper. Sign this, sign that. COBRA paperwork, severance agreement, um, non-compete, invention assignment, all this stuff. Don't sign a damn thing until you've gone home and gone through that grieving process because you are emotionally vulnerable. You're making decisions completely out of amygdala hijack and disappointment and depression and upset. If you sign anything, you will regret it. I lived through this. Um, you know, Lee can talk to the pain of it. At one point, I signed something that probably, I think the ultimate cost was about $25,000 um, because I didn't get proper legal advice on everything that I did. Luckily for me, I'm a good social engineer. I worked it out. Um, I didn't pay them anything, actually, which was really quite nice. But the goal here is to make sure you're making these decisions in your right mind. Go home, get legal advice, ask as many questions as you need to. That's what, one of the big mistakes and the mistake I made. You know, you don't ask questions because you don't want to look dumb. That's how you end up looking dumb. Yeah, you, you know, that's, it's, it's very important. You know, you know, when this happens, I think that the most, you know, what, this might kind of sound stupid if it ever happens to you, but, you know, you just take a deep breath, keep your composure, don't do anything to make yourself look foolish, don't go postal or start yelling at people or, you know, get all emotional. It's emotional, and I hate to say it, but hold it in, swallow it, and, 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 and just, you know, the, you know the sun will rise again and stuff like that. But when you when they'll they will throw all this paperwork at you and say, well, you know, we'll give you a severance if, or you know, you can have your next two weeks pay if. Now at that time you have no other income. You think, wow, my whole income supply is off. Two weeks of pay, I'll sign anything. You have to think about like you know your upside, your downside. What am I really giving up? Is anything restricting me and stuff like that? Normally, when somebody's giving you a small sum of money for giving away a lot of your rights, you're traditionally on the wrong side of that equation. So you think about it. See an expert. And don't just call up like your cousin and say, hey, you know, you just graduated law school. Hey, here's my, you know, go see a career person. Now, the different parts of where your career is might be different things. If you're a senior executive of a company, you need to spend a lot more time and money on this before you sign anything because the deltas are probably bigger as well. But if you're a you know, junior person, think about it. You know, you, at that point, you might just consult a friend who's an attorney somewhere and stuff like that. But, but don't sign anything because once it's an ink, it's an ink. But take a deep breath there. Speaking of taking a deep breath, at that point, it's time to get down to it. Um, first step is to go back through your plan. You need to recalculate how much runway you have. Um, this is the moment at which you need to know exactly how long you can live before you, know, you get kicked out of your house and you're eating. Um, you you're know, moving back in with your parents. Yeah, you're moving back in with your parents, exactly. Um, at the same time, don't panic. No matter how bad it looks, nothing good happens when you're panicking. Take a deep breath, 
realize you have two different types of plan. If, you ha if your runway is generally less than somewhere between 30 to 90 days, your goal is either to extend the runway by doing contract work or you know, selling stuff on eBay or something um, to extend the runway, or to go into a very short-term type of job search. If you've got longer than that, you can take your time and do a more long-term search. And I'm going to quickly go through each of the short-term each of the type of job searches. Short-term search is generally not recommended. Nobody wants to be there. You would love to have lots of time to evaluate the companies that you want to work with. Um, anybody who's read the Forget the Parachute book that I did knows what I'm talking about. Um, but if you need a job quickly and you know your your parameters are sort of fuzzy, the goal is to line up as many opportunities as you, as you can pick the best one. Um, first step there is always reach out to your network. You know, as Lee says, call in some favors. Somebody probably knows somebody who's hiring. That might be the right thing. Um, the second one is to get your resume out there and get it in front of the right people at the right companies that have the right opportunities. Um, basically, your goal is to get as many people to hear of you and know that you're looking as possible in a short period of time. Try and get as many offers as you can that are really targeted and related to what you're currently doing. We talked earlier about the difference between a job that stretches you and a job that you're fit for today. This is where you're looking for a job that you're fit for today and you're not as worried about what it's going to give you in two years, right? Because if you don't, if you're moving back in with your parents after 30 days, this is probably better than that no matter how bad the job is. Um, that you said, might have to take a short-term hit, and, yeah. and that'll be fine. I mean, that said, you don't want to shoot yourself completely in the foot. You don't want to go... But that's, I mean, that's also a part where you might even think about you know, really trying to find some 1099 or contract work, where a lot of those jobs are very more skill-focused as opposed to career-focused. So that's where you can leverage a technical skill that you still are very sharp at or something that you've become very good at to pick up a 30-day contract, a 60-day contract, a 120-day you know, contract, whatever it might be. Um, and, and those are all about extending runway. Yes, I mean, and, and that just buys you time. That yeah. will buy you time, and, and that will build some relationships, and, and you never know. But you know, and normally 1099 work is very much job-related. And you know, W two work is more career related. Yeah. You know, it buys you time to go into this kind of a process where you really consult your plan. You find someone that is, you know, that that ideal scenario Lee was talking about earlier. Someone who needs something that can also give you what you want, um, as far as your plan goes. Then you go out and create the opportunities and and actually close the deal. Which closing the deal brings it back to resumes. Um, ultimately, your resume is a sales letter. It's a brochure for you, Inc. Um, it, most people don't think about it like that. It drives me nuts. I read resumes, and it's all about what they want. You know, what's the first se section on a traditional resume? Objective. What does the objective section say? It tells me all about what you want. I don't care what you want as a hiring manager. I don't really care that your objective is to be a goat farmer in Bolivia after you've you know, made your money <laughs> at a dot com. I really care that you can solve my problem. Much like when you're buying a product and you read the brochure for the product, you don't really care what the company hopes to accomplish. You don't care what their quarterly targets are. You don't care what their goals are. You care if the product you're buying gives you what you need. If your resume doesn't tell the client what they need, your resume is not doing a good job. Your resume should, also, should ultimately be tailored so that the client reads it and it is going to tell them what they're going to get. That means your resume should be about your accomplishments. It's not about, oh, look, I know C++. Well, you know, Lee, Lee's the C++ guy, right? <laughs> um, Lee equals C++. You know, anyone can say they're a C++ person. Can't, Lee, you know, Lee probably can't say, I wrote a 1,000-word a program or a thousand line program in C++, I'm making this example up on the fly so it doesn't make much sense, but um, a thousand line program in C++ that does X, Y, and Z and uses the following third party libraries and modules. That tells me a lot about what you can give me. Saying I know C++ tells me not very much, right? Think about your resume when you're writing it as you were writing a sales brochure for a product. You know, when you, when you put together your resume, right, I mean, you think about it. So, you know, different people look for different things. You know, one of the things that you have to do is 
do a little social engineering and figure out what's important to your audience and then tell your resume that way. Like one of the biggest mistakes I see people send to me, the first line is like a senior object, a senior leadership position as a information security officer. I'm like, you know, I'm like, dude, you got to take that completely. I said, so the only jobs that you want are probably going to be the jobs that the person who you're going to be who's going to interview you already has so like that doesn't really work you know so like you have to think about it like you know where is my marketability where is really my edge and then that customer who's looking for something and you know things do get you know spilled out in job descriptions or in listening to the recruiters that you're dealing with and stuff like that and what they're dealing with you know you really generally want to avoid working with people putting your career in somebody's hand that really doesn't know much about like what you do and your skills and like what would make sense for you and stuff like that you really want to put yourself in you know you really want to put yourself in, in, in around people um you know who can help help you get and understand where you are right like so i think the concept is this is that when you're when you're pulling this resume together is that you know understand almost at the least common denominator level about like where your skills will help that person do their job better where that skill will help the company i mean i think that a really good you know if you have to do an objective statement you know to you know you could do something very simple to say to to utilize my skills um as an information security professional to make the pos uh, to make the maximum impact on my employer i mean you could do something that's very simple to that if you feel that if you feel that you have to have an objective statement nobody can say well we don't want people who are going to maximize their skills and make positive impacts and stuff like that you know understand who's probably reading your resume an hr person's reading their resume and stuff like that so think about in a lot of cases if you just start popping your things off to these internet sites and stuff like that you might have to dress up that resume so idiot 101 can figure that out. I mean, you you really might have to do that cuz that cuz most HR people aren't going to understand the difference between, you know, a web app security person or a, you know, a software, you know, a, a a software security person or a, a network security person or somebody who understands policy and compliance versus somebody who understands information risk management. You're not going to see those types of things. So what you have to do is you have to think about, you know, who's going to be, you know, where's the gatekeeper? How do I get by the gatekeeper? How do I social engineer this process basically? Um, we're just going to jump ahead into a couple of interview specifics. Um, Lee probably should talk about the overqualified thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people say, you know, well, you know, you, you get, you know, let go of this, well, well, you're overqualified for this position, right? So you have to try to avoid that. You have to try to like cut that off at the pass if that's possible. If you're interviewing, if you need a job and you're interviewing for something that you're kind of like uh, you know that that you might not have considered if you weren't in a predicament and stuff like that. So I mean, I think that at those point in time where you really kind of like you know, you, you really start simplifying your knowledge. You start focusing on, you know, the foundation of your skill set, the technical skills. Like you know, one of the worst things that people can say in an interview is, well, yeah, I, I used to be technical. Or, um, yeah, no, I don't really do that anymore. Or, you know, I have other people in my team that do that work. You know, those are things that will get you killed in the job hunt and stuff like that. So you should really kind of start thinking about, you know, kind of, you know, where you came from. And that's why it's important to keep your skills sharp, to keep your industry knowledge sharp, to really to stay on. still live here. Yeah, I mean, it was really great. I, mean, yeah, I really blast, appreciate, though. I mean, you know, it, it was a small intimate setting for a long period of time. I really appreciate you guys all, you know, staying and listening and, you know, and, and, and interacting. I yeah, mean, hopefully it was, we um, were useful and you got something out of it. Yeah, I mean, it was. Did Twitter think so? <laughs> so. Were people showing up on the screen in there? I thought that was awesome, by the way. I walked into that room, and there's a live Twitter feed of all the um, hashtag Source Boston stuff. It's kind of cool. The best thing was when I asked a question, and then I walked into the room, looked up, and realized there's an ad that there that I hadn't noticed yet. That's funny. That fun. That's very funny. So who's not on Twitter here? Anyone? Steve, you're on Twitter, aren't you? Yeah. Right. 
That's true of most of us. I don't have to ask you. You're on Twitter more than any of us. He is Twitter. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Terrifying. Yeah, what's, yeah, tell me what that's all about. I've been hearing about that. You're He's got all sorts of tools. Yeah, that's how we look at it and go and, hey, I'm most active when there's conferences going on. What was in April? Oh, that was RSA. Funny. I can't believe you sat here the whole time and didn't say one word. I was about to mention.